Hello everyone, Darren here, and welcome back to Satisfactory. Now in this video, we're gonna be building a liquid biofuel factory, and I have to say, it's probably my favorite build ever. I'm really, really happy with how it looks at the end. Now I normally show a few bits of the factory in the intro to entice people. This one just looks so damn good that I'm just gonna show you this as a little tease. And it won't be until the last 15 minutes or so that we turn on global illumination and I promise you, you'll be impressed by how good it looks. No cheating, don't be skipping to the end. Come on. Now this video will serve as a build along guide. You don't have to have watched the previous videos, but if you have, you'll have a little bit of context for where I'm at in this current playthrough in terms of progress. All is going to be explained once you get started, what you're going to need, how many machines, all of that. But before we do, I wanted to give a thank you to this week's sponsor, Prosperous Universe. Have you ever watched a sci-fi movie where you see thousands of ships duking it out in battle and wondered, how the hell did this all come together? How does the economy work and how long did it take them to mine it, build it and deploy them? Are there competing companies vying for power and dominance on some galactic market somewhere? Well, it turns out yes, and that's what Prosperous Universe is. It's an ultra-realistic economic simulator set across the galaxy. It's online, it's free, and it can be played in your browser. Every resource and commodity is provided by real people. You start with your own company and can decide in this sandbox to mine resources, design ships, deliver and trade, play the stocks, all in a massive player-driven economy. Every price is determined by supply and demand on a real-time exchange 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It's crazy ambitious. The game is free to play, but there's an optional purchase of a pro license that gives you some more advanced features, which are more geared towards mid to late game players. You interact with the game through a customizable UI called Apex, allowing you to focus on what you want, as you can be a cutthroat CEO, a political leader, an explorer on the fringes, or just some guy mining a desolate planet keeping things local. So go check it out at prosperousuniverse.com and please do click the link in the top comment or the description which will take you right there but it'll just let them know that I sent you. Thanks again to Prosperous Universe for sponsoring this video. Alright ladies and gentlemen, I am super stoked for today's video because it is a one video factory. Can you believe it? Not some multi-tiered, multi-stage process with 20 hours of content you have to follow, a million production diagrams bankrupts me creatively and has me pulling what little hair left out of my head that I have. Instead, it all fits very neatly on one page, and it's been a creative palette cleanser, I would say, because it's quite different. There's not many people out there doing liquid biofuel because it's relatively a new thing in terms of its uses, its usefulness. And so what do you use it for? So basically, the jetpack. Jetpack can now take multiple types of fuel, and it has different results depending on which ones you use. If you use biofuel, it burns the slowest, so you can kind of go the furthest, and that makes it a top tier choice for something worth having. However, the double-edged sword, it has a pretty painful drawback, and that is that vegetation is needed to make biofuel, uh, or animal remains, things like that. The problem there is you can't automate that, you have to go out and get it. Now I've said since the beginning of this series, but even if you're just joining for the first time, good rule of thumb is do not waste anything. If you collect grass, wood, leaves, flowers, whatever it might be, just always put it in a container. You'll use it later, trust me. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. I've got containers full of grass and wood and everything we chop down to clear and make room for factories. And now we're gonna refine that all into liquid biofuel, giving us fuel for our jetpack for hopefully many, many hours to come. So, there's a few prerequisites in getting this factory built and up and running. Of course, if you want to follow along, all the production documents and the floor plans and everything have actually been done before this video, so it's all ready to go, and it should be ready as soon as this video goes live. So check them out in the description, all for free, don't need to be a channel member or anything. I'd like it if you liked the video, that would help a lot, maybe share it with friends, etc. And hey, I'm not going to stop you from being a channel member, but you do have it for free. Just go to whatdarrenplays.com slash satisfactory. And you'll see everything that's needed to make this factory possible. We'll also talk about some of the drawbacks of the factory a little later on, as it's not perfect, and we'll talk about why that is later. In terms of efficacy, it is fine, but there are a few things you could do to maybe make it a bit more convenient. And again, we'll talk about that later. So. Before we get started, what you'd need to have done, and I've already marked it in my to-do list on the right-hand side of the screen, is I've made some circuit boards and supercomputers. You don't actually need the circuit boards anymore, 
but I had to use them in order to make the supercomputer. So basically, just with a couple of manufacturers just over in the distance, I manually fed them all the different things they'd need in order to progress in the MAM tree in the Caterium chain to advance things like high-speed connectors, computers, circuit boards, and then eventually supercomputers. Why do we need supercomputers for a biofuel factory? Well, basically, we need them to make programmable splitters. This factory is going to be designed so that you can just run up, dump all of your biomass, all the various different types of vegetation, alien remains you have, into one container, and the factory will just spit back out liquid biofuel and color cartridges. That's at least the idea. So then you don't have to be worried about dumping the right things into different boxes. It'll sort it for us, and the best way to sort it is with programmable splitters. Although it is possible with smart splitters, it would just, you just need way, way, way more of them. And we're building in a location that's a little space constrained, because it's cool. At least I think so, and we'll talk about it when we get over there. Right, so, first thing we then need to do is actually unlock the milestone. Well, sorry, I shouldn't get ahead of myself. Provided you have the circuit boards to make about 10 programmable splitters, then you're good to go. It's one supercomputer for one programmable splitter. So after you make the certain amount you need to unlock programmable splitters, which I think is 50, if you make 60 in total, the 10 left over will be enough then to carry you through this build. All right, so in the milestones in our hub, we have the alternative fluid transport milestone. And for that, we want it for the packager and for the packaged liquid biofuel and, of course, the liquid biofuel recipes. It's going to require some heavy modular frames, which, again, I had set up previously in terms of just a very temporary setup that we manually feed the machines. As you can see from the recipes on screen, nothing that's needed is that complicated. We have all these things already. It's just not in a convenient location, so I just manually crafted it myself. All right, we'll select that milestone. We'll feed it everything we got. And away we go. Alright, so... Fluids can now be packaged to allow for transportation via vehicles and conveyor belts. Additionally, highly improved biofuel can now be produced. So that's a new little addition that they've given Ada, saying that it's highly improved, because it didn't used to be that useful before. Now that it can actually be used in the jetpack, that's kind of its primary, primary use, I would say. Alright, so I've pretty much got everything I need. We're gonna need... 15 constructors, 3 smelters, 2 minor Mark 1s, 1 assembler, 1 refinery, and a bunch of industrial storage containers. Actually, only marked 1, but I think we'll need maybe 3, and then 1 regular storage container, and a water extractor. So, quite an eclectic amount of machines, kind of using a bit of everything. Ah, what we'll need now that I haven't listed is a packager, just one. So we'll list that. So that's going to require a little bit of plastic and rubber, which I've just left over here. And then we'll drive on over to the site, the location. I thought I would just mention really quickly as well that I'm still adding to the copper and Caterium factory, which if you've been following the channel, you'll know has been the big build that I've been working on for the last four episodes. And while I'm still building it, I'm updating the save file for everyone all the time. It's mostly just the cosmetics I'm doing now, putting some lights inside, doing the walls, that kind of thing. Some of it was done on a stream of mine recently where we kind of... Um, had some community input, I guess you could say, on how the design should look and also be something that wouldn't take forever to make it look really, really nice. Obviously, the more intricate and more detailed you make a build, the more hours you're just adding to it all the time. So I wanted a relatively quick-to-do kind of cosmetic, but something that looked good at the same time, if possible. So I feel like we struck a nice middle ground there. Anyways, long story short, that's all now available in terms of the blueprints I used and the save file as I update it every couple of days or so anytime I make any changes to it. So you can obviously go grab that for free in the description as well. All right, so we are here on location. Let's just have a quick look at where we are in between these two lakes. Remember, these little boxes that I've left around, those are to denote hard drive sites that I've already got. So just in case you're ever wondering which ones have I gone out and grabbed, you can again check out my save file, or you can just have a look at the screen and see which ones have been grabbed already. Alright, so we're going to be building in a bit of a weird location, and it's going to be down here. You see that? There's something in there. Let's check it out. So this is where I've chosen to build the biofuel factory. In a bioluminescence cave. Now, it's interesting music in the background for this place specifically, and that's because of this. What is that? 
What the hell is that? Why, it's a tape for Deep Rock Galactic. So, something I haven't actually unlocked yet, or purchased, I suppose, is the boombox. And this is one of the tapes for the boombox. So I thought it'd be fun to use the soundtrack for Deep Rock Galactic in today's episode, while we're building in this cave. Alright, so to begin the build, we look to our to-do list. On the right-hand side of the screen, we've of course already achieved our prerequisite of 10 supercomputers in our pocket to make our programmable splitters. We have achieved our milestone to unlock the liquid biofuel recipe and get a packager. Next up, we're going to be doing out the floors, then placing in the machines, then doing the entrance to this place, then doing power, hooking everything up, playing around with the jetpack itself by achieving that milestone, and then, if we've got any time left, doing some of the cosmetics for the place. So, let's begin. Now, whoops, trying to jump here is not easy. It's so dark and hazardous terrain is all around us. And that's actually one of the tricky things with this build. The place isn't that big, right? The cave system is quite small. It is just a circle. It's just a little lake with a slug right there in the center. And we're going to be leaving that slug there. You can take him if you want. I'm actually going to be putting more slugs in there, if anything. <laughs> and we'll talk about why that is later. It's, it's for cosmetic purposes. All right, so one of the tricky things with actually doing out the floors of this place, even though we have the floor plan documents, is the fact that we have quite irregularly shaped terrain here. And that's going to be one of the challenges with building here. Now, also, we're going to brighten it up. We'll turn off global illumination for now. But I'll be popping it back on when the build is done. This is going to brighten up the place a little bit. So get used to it. This is as bright as it's going to get. If it's not as bright for you, turn up your gamma. I get that comment a lot. Okay, so in order to get started, I've already worked out where our hallway is going to be coming in. But we're doing that last because it's really finicky to follow along with. So a separate floor plan document will probably be needed just for the hallway because of how the world grid is shaped. Remember, we're going to be using the world grid, but you always want to use a 2 meter foundation when starting this. I'm going to use the fix it foundation just so it's super clear where everything begins and ends. Alright, so even I will have to struggle a little bit to eyeball this one just first off. So holding control, I'm just going to place this in right here. I'm going to have to jump up to it. Yeah, we need to go even higher than this. I think that is the right height. I'll just double check. How much lower could we come down? No, I'm pretty sure that's it. So you're left with this little spindly thing, this almost almost hexagonal shape, right? Half covered. So holding control snaps you to a world grid. You have to use a two meter foundation for it, okay? Don't use the one meter. And when your grid is just below that line there, right, where we kind of cross-section that thing, then we're good. Now, the next complicated bit is this. And this will, once we have this bit down, you know, it should be easy after that. I'm gonna grab this foundation. So we just have a little grid of four here, just at this like rock arch entrance, right? So the arch is there, if you know what I mean. So we're gonna grab one here, holding control now. I wanna basically, I'll just list it here, locking it in place by pressing H. Oh, it didn't actually do that. There we go. By pressing H, or the hotkey of your choice, and then nudging it over to the halfway mark, which is here. Okay, so we're nudging it over to the halfway mark, and then placing this in. Now, going to get rid of the bottom bits, and we'll just copy one right under that. Okay? So now we'll get rid of this. So what I've done is use the exact same height we talked about, but I've just pushed it out a half foundation. That's what's happened here. And that's our starting point. So hopefully people can follow along with that. There will be pictures and the floor plan itself in the description, like I said, just so you can orientate yourself properly with that. That's the best way I found it. So what you're left with is we're cutting right across that halfway mark of this kind of hexagonal shape here. But also there's a gap, right? There's a gap between me and it. And this is the gap. So hopefully we're all orientated now. All right, so using the floor plans, let's start working this out. We're going to be five and a half. So we want to be north facing. So I'm facing north right now. And we obviously have our compass up on the top of the screen. So we can see N facing north. And that's the way the floor plans are laid out. So it's X axis and then Y axis. So five and a half foundations across and six down. So starting here, that's one, two. And then we go three, four, five, six. So that's our six, and then we have to go across five and a half. I know, annoying number. So one, two, three, four, and five. So 
right? So one, two, three, four, and five. And then this one would need to be a half. So we'll just grab a half foundation, rotate it around. Just leave it like that. Now we can change this later when we're doing cosmetics. It's just to get the overall layout right. All right, so that's what we're left with. Five and a half across and six down. All right, let's continue. So now we're going to do three by two and a half. All right, I was going to put down a lookout tower so we can actually get a bird's eye view in this place. But of course, we're in a cave, so I can't quite do that. But the entire top floor is now in position. So I just wanted to address something. So the reason I didn't show placing every foundation is one, it's quite tedious to do. Two, you've got a floor plan to look at. And three, there's a lot of redundancies that would make it even more tedious to follow along like this. Why is there, for instance, two half-meter foundations next to each other? Why not just use a full foundation? You can totally do that if you want. I'm just following the floor plan as rigidly as possible. And then when we do the cosmetic pass at the end of the video, we kind of uproot some of this. So it's really just about getting the shape. If you feel like you can get the shape the exact same, doing it however you want, go for it. That's just what I'm doing here as well. And trying to make it as clear as possible what I've done by using the fix-it foundation first rather than concrete or something else. All right, so doing the bottom floor is actually a little harder than doing the top floor. The placement is super important of this first foundation, but then it's actually smooth sailing. So there's no half foundations or anything. And I'm sorry, I know some people don't follow along. They just watch. So I know I'm being very handholdy here for no reason, but for people that do, I just want to be super ultra clear that you need to pay attention for this bit if you want to get the next floor down correct. All right, so we're going to start with the wall and we're going to latch on to that piece right there. Not to this piece, not to here, to there. One, two, three is where we come down. And then we pop down a foundation just in the front. Now we'll use a four meter foundation for this because it's sinking down to the water. It'll look better that way anyway. So that's where our first foundation goes. And that, if you have that right, everything should be easy from here on out. But if you go onto the sides or you're not the right height, my walls always have their tops at the same height as the floor that you stand on, yeah? Just like this one, right? The wall, if it was to continue down, it's the top of that wall will be in line with where we are now. So that's how I always do it. Keeps things evenly spaced, four meters each time. Uh, so, all right, so this is gonna be a four by four. So one, two, three, and two, three. So we're going really close to the edge, but not quite all the way. All right, so that's our first little section. That's gonna be a nice four by four. The next one is a three by 11. So one, two, three. And then we just go out to 10. Next up, we have a two by three. So one, two, come down to three. Next up, we have an eight by six, and we'll start it here. So if this is the vertical axis, that's our six. And this is gonna go, go across eight. So we're going well into the ground here to do this. So let's go seven out from here. So can we even do that? Let's just do five then, but it still has to be seven on other, all other sides if we can. There we go, seven. Okay, so a lot of that is taken up by all that terrain that's now bleeding over and encroaching and blending in. But that's totally fine. We're building in a cave, so it's to be expected. Uh, the next bit is a six by four. So the four is on the vertical axis like this. And the six is across, so we can go across now five. It's gonna leave us just with that little area in the center there. And that's it. That's our bottom floor completely done. So all the foundations are now in place. So we're left with this open gap here. And my plan for this is to place a few extra slugs in there. And they should look kind of cool. But don't worry if you don't want to bother doing that, it's fine. Maybe put some dogs in there or something. The little lizard doggos. All right, so time to get started with the actual machines themselves. So we're gonna place down all the machines and then we'll do the logistics afterwards and hook up like, you know, give them their recipes and their clock speeds and all of that kind of thing. So just really quickly wanted to point out, if you'd looked earlier in the video, you would have noticed this was a half foundation. Now it's a full one. I just misjudged the amount. The floor plan was actually correct. I just miscounted it. So uh, 
it's just one of those minor changes. Doesn't really matter. But anyway, uh, as long as you're following the floor plan, you should be totally fine. So starting here, one, two, three. This will be the third foundation over. We want to use this one. And we want to be kind of center aligned with it, but then just nudge ourselves forward one, right? So the legs of the machine are just tucked in just a bit. And we're in the center of the foundation as well. All right, so that's one. And then we want to basically align with that one and do a second one here and then a third one just here. So hopefully that makes sense. Three found or sorry, three smelters all aligned with their own respective foundation and all aligned with each other. Each one's going to have a floor hole going in front of it. And we'll set it up in a moment, but that's going to be doing iron, iron, and copper, I believe. So all of these can handle... Well, we'll save the logistics till later, I guess. I always get ahead of myself. Right, next thing then is the constructors. So we'll hop down here. And we can actually see that they're nicely aligned now. So that's where I made a mistake earlier, basically, and I realized something was off. So we'll get our constructors out. We're going to place four of these down. So we know the floor hole elevator thing is going to come down that way. So you're going to shift this constructor all the way forward so its bounding box is aligned with the foundation itself. If it was center aligned, it'd be creeping over just a little bit there and creeping over here. But instead, we're just pushing it forward that extra little bit. Again, by pressing H to lock our hologram using the arrow keys to actually move it around. Yeah, so that's how we do that. All right. So and of course, center aligning it. So there we go. So that's one constructor in place. Two, three, and oh, <laughs> so four constructors in total right there. We'll stay on the theme of constructors, I think, and do some of the other ones. So there's some over here. Uh, this one might be a bit trickier to line up, but it shouldn't matter too much. I think so basically doing the similar thing, keeping the bounding box aligned with the line of the foundation. We need to now go across to what I think is the center here. I think that should be accurate. Right, so we're left with uh, one and a half foundations walking space around. We're left to go two foundations deep, although this one is covered in rubble. So starting there, that's going to be one, two, three, and four. And yep, facing away from me. So that does leave just enough room to bring a belt out here. I think that's the idea. I say I think it's the idea. I'm the one that designed it. I just don't quite remember. <laughs> All right, so there's four constructors there. The next one is then going to go here. All right, so we're going to rotate around. Again, similar sort of principle, but we're going to actually nudge this over just one. And this time, we're going to have the legs come back over the line by two. So we're lining up the front bounding box with this foundation, not the back. All right, so we'll leave it at that. So we're going to also need four here. All right, four constructors. So the idea is that along here, um, mergers will continue and then they'll turn right and then go into two more constructors. So one's going to have to be here. So aligning the center of this constructor with the center here and then another one there. Gives a tiny bit of walking space on this side and still room for the mergers to kind of carry that stuff out. Okay, that's all fine. Going to be a merger in the center, most likely here. And I want to say that's just going to continue forward and then turn right and go into a refinery. Or am I forgetting something? Hang on just one sec. These are the solid biofuel ones, I think. It's probably going to be a container box or something like here. Yeah, okay, so let's go with a refinery. Oh, I'm missing some steel pipe. Oh, no. I actually can't place this down. I thought I had everything. I guess not. Um, so that's the refinery. The other one, then, would be the water extractor, which we could place down now as well. Still have what we need for that. So the water extractor is going to face... I guess that's facing west. And we're going to bring it over as close to the edge as we can without getting it into trouble. Ooh, there's actually a snap point in line with the constructors. So, yeah, I think just lock on to that. Yeah, it's kind of perfect, actually. What's it lined onto? It's lined onto that constructor. Okay, yeah, it's fine. Fine by me. Let's do it. Yeah, so the idea is that the water is going to come out here and travel into a refinery, and the solid biofuel will come out this way and go into the same refinery, thus making the liquid biofuel. Uh, one machine that I've forgotten to place, or two, actually, is the assembler. So we'll just lock that in place right now. So I need it to come out to the right by one. That should align it 
this input with that output. Or another way of thinking of it is this middle point is aligned with that input. And that's actually what I'm more interested in. And I'm going to bring it back, which I think is okay, just to so it lines up with the edge and the seam of that foundation. All right, that's our assembler. Uh, and then finally, it's the packager. Used for packaging and unpacking of fluids. Gives you 10 meters of head lift. So this one is an interesting one. It's going to have to go in the middle of these and pretty much as close to the edge as it can. Yeah, right there before it clips over. All right, that's our packager. Now, I obviously, for some, somehow... Oh, I just didn't see it. Yeah, I don't have the steel pipe needed. Out of everything else, I'm gonna have to go make a run and get the steel pipes that I missed. All right, so we got what we need for a refinery. So the placement is gonna be alongside the bounding box of that constructor there, but then also lined up with it too. So if we just push that a bit further back, that should be good enough, I think. Let's lock it in. Okay, cool. So next up we'll do all of, or just the storage containers, and then we can work out the logistics. So the storage containers are also in a bit of an awkward spot. Right, so storage containers. I feel like this is where the floor holes have to go for both of them. Now, we'll just use a big one for this area here. because This is going to be receiving the liquid biofuel, and a small one for here. So that's going to be receiving color cartridges. And then in the middle of both, somewhere here, this is going to be our actual container for dumping all the vegetation and stuff into it. So this is our main drop-off container. So it's basically in between these two smaller ones, and uh, it's center aligned on these two foundations. So that's that. So the idea is that we're going to be coming in from here. We'll run in dump all the material in here and everything we have to collect is here and here so it's just super quick and easy to access relatively speaking um, before then obviously you have to venture back out the cave all right so that's basically all of the machines or the components are now all placed we just have to actually hook them up together with logistics so i think we'll start over with the smelters just because that's the first machines we've placed um, so let's start configuring these and then hooking up their belts so this is going to be iron and we're going to set it to 75%, which is going to be a very common number we use today. So let's just set it to that one as well. So iron, 75%. So it's doing 22.5 on the output. And then for this one, it's just going to be doing copper. No adjustments needed. 30 in, 30 out. All right, so then we'll hook up our belts. That's on the receive. That's to receive. And that's to receive. All right, mark one to out of our minds. And we'll flow downstairs then. Right, so this is where it gets... Somewhat interesting, right? We bring this down. It's aiming straight into its little buddy there. This one's going to be doing the same. This one isn't, though. We're going to actually get a splitter for this final one here. And I think I have to move it just that little bit forward. All right, let's try this. So that's our 30 copper ore coming down, going into a splitter, with 15 going that way and 15 going this way. So now we'll set this to be a copper sheet. And again... 75%. So it's taking in that 15 now. It's putting out 7.5. So we'll copy that and set it on this machine as well. So these two are a pair. Alright, then we just hook up our iron. So each of these can just receive the standard amount. Now these machines will also have to be set to 75. So they're doing 15 per minute. They're taking in that 22.5 that we were giving out from the smelters upstairs. So both of them, again, have the same setting. So that's two iron plates and two copper sheets all right so the next thing then will be getting a merger and aiming it towards the assembler so somewhere kind of middle will be good bringing the first iron machine in bringing the second iron machine in and bringing that into the right input uh, then we'll do a similar thing here we'll get a merger but we'll place it facing towards me so get the first copper sheets in and hmm this should just go in like that, but I have to get the spacing right here. So that's where we want to start. One, two. And then we just go like that. So the belts not crossing over. They're just right next to each other, which is nice. All right, we'll grab this. Let's bring this across. One, two. And feed that in. 
All right, so there we go. Copper sheet, copper sheet into a merger and then into the assembler. Iron plate, iron plate, merged and into the assembler. And that's for a recipe I don't have yet. So what we want is a canister, an empty canister, so that we can fill it in the packager with some sort of liquid. All right, so we've just unlocked it. So I don't have any of the alternate recipes yet for it because we couldn't have been given any from the hard drive sites. I actually went around collecting hard drives and opening them and then I realized, oh, it can't give it to me yet because we have to actually open the milestone before it can actually give me the recipe for it. So I don't have it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into kind of creative mode in another save file, load it as a blueprint, save the blueprint, and then load that machine here and it'll have the recipe in it. So it's a little workaround. You could just go out and find some hard drives, or you could do what I'm doing right now. All right, I'm back. We've got our little hacks ready to go. So we'll get rid of the standard assembler that was there. I'm just going to open up my blueprints now. If we type can, assembler canister. So I'll give this out as well in the whatironplace.com slash satisfactory link. It's just a blueprint with literally this recipe in it. So alternate coated iron canister. It takes in 30 iron plates and 15 copper sheets per minute giving you 60 empty canisters per minute. So just hook that back up. So the way that's done is you just go into advanced game settings when you're loading a save, toggle on unlocking everything, open up a blueprint designer, place in an assembler, choose the recipe, save it as a blueprint, and then load your original save. Blueprints are saved independently of your normal save game, and that's how that's possible. Um, so yeah, if that doesn't work in the future, I suppose you just have to go out and find a hard drive and keep rolling it until you get the one you need. But like I said, you won't get it until you've at least done the milestone, which I should have done beforehand. I went out and got like six hard drives for no reason. Anyways, so I feel like I've done the work, you know. Right, so empty canister, good to go. And if you want a refresher, we have 7.5 and 7.5 per minute copper sheets. That's going to be 15, which is what's required. And then we have 22.5 coming in, right? 22.5, 22.5 giving us 15 per minute, 2 15s is 30, and we need 30 per minute. So that's basically how that's working. Okay, so those canisters are gonna be needed in here for our new packaged liquid biofuel recipe. So you might be wondering about all these other uh, recipes right there to unpack the fuel. So if you wanna separate fuel out of a packager, and some people move liquids vast distances by transporting it on a train or something in packaged form and then unpackage it. I've never understood why people do that rather than just moving it on a freight train with liquids. But anyways, you can let me know in the comments, I guess. But I've never really understood why you'd move fuel. Some people say diluted packaged fuel is just a better recipe, so maybe that's why. Anyways, getting off track. Packaged liquid biofuel. That's what we're going with. So we're going to actually overclock this machine so that we're using 60. I thought about using two, but I just feel like I couldn't make the placement work. Trust me, when you see the cosmetics, it'll make more sense. So I don't mind overclocking one machine. Plus, this place isn't always going to be running constantly. So 150%, 60 per minute uh, is going to require the 60 cans per minute that we're making. So we want the cans to go straight in here. So it's going to be flowing along and then in. But we have one small problem. And that is this line of... There's going to be a line of belts traveling out this way, right here. So what we'll have to do is just stop it short somewhere like here. So what I'm going to do is get an elevator, a lift, rotate that way, and a lift here, rotating that way, but input. They'll join onto each other. You actually can't place a belt between them. They are linked now, and I quite like the look of that. Two little hoses going into each other. Uh, I'll move this and send it in. All right, so that's just to create the clearance for one of the belts traveling along this way. Could have done it the other way around, right? This could have been the one that goes up and over, but that's just the way I've done it. All right, so that's the first part of the chain done, right? That's making canisters and sending it in there. Now we haven't hooked it up to the actual ore deposits, which are just outside the entrance. We'll do that in a moment. Uh, we'll probably actually have to do that last because I need to put in the floors for the entrance. Um, but for the internals of the factory, we're looking good. Okay, so out of here, Oh, I just realized something. This isn't quite aligned, is it? Oh, no, it is. It is. Because I'm going to be grabbing this, reversing it so it's an input, and just sending it in like so. Yeah, that's totally good. So our liquid biofuel will flow up that way. Now, we're making, what, 60 per minute? So a Mark 1 belt is obviously totally fine there. 
Okay, so next up is the kind of programmable splitter side of things. We've got to feed all these machines with various different things. So let's begin. So we'll start up here. We know this is our dump box where we dump all of our vegetation and it flows down. We're Mark 3 out of our minds. So this is where it's coming down from. And it's going to go into our first splitter. So bring this down like so. Now, we'll get a programmable splitter, and I'm going to place it right here. So we'll just have to re-hook that one back in. I was just trying to get the spacing, but there we go. Hooked in. Use that to be a Mark III. Okay. Now, we're not going to configure any of the programmable splitters until the end. I'll just, just do that bit after, because it can get a bit stop-starty if we keep doing that now. But this will be one of the programmable splitters, and just to our left, we're going to have a standard-sized storage container. That's all. And just in case, we'll give it a Mark III belt also. So that's just going to sit there. We'll talk about that a bit later. Next up, I'm going to go forward to maybe just this bit of the foundation on the line. Lock in another programmable splitter. Oh, actually, sorry, 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 sorry. Let's bring that back. We'll start it in the middle of the foundation just here. Much more close to me. Um, because there was actually one constructor I forgot to set up, which is going to be set up right here. So, constructor, and we'll just bring that back here. So, that's now centered on the foundation itself. And we'll get a Mark 1. Actually, we'll get a Mark 3 as well. Why not? Send that in there. So, what this is going to be doing is color cartridges. So, this splitter is now going to be deciding, okay, if you are flowers, flowers goes straight into here. And we're going to bang out some color cartridges. And they're just going to go straight up into this one. So that's the only two things we're collecting from this place. is color cartridges and liquid biofuel. Uh, so that will need to be a Mark II belt because it's outputting 100 per minute. All right, and a Mark II lift. Cool, so those are the two outputs totally done. Right, now out the left side and the right side, we won't configure it just yet, but on the left side, it's gonna be all the vegetation. I think it'll have to be Mark III, so this will be like wood and uh, mycelia, leaves. I think that's it, actually. But that's all going to... Oh, and a biomass as well, actually, will be traveling down this way. So let's leave another mark here. Is this in the center? No, it's not. <laughs> Thought it was a bit off. All right, and just continue that all the way down to the end. Actually, we'll set up these splitters now. So we need several programmable splitters now in a row. Alright, so we'll have to shift that over just slightly, like so. So they're right next to the machine, but that's by design. Let's do one there, two, and three. That'll just be the third one there, that's it. Okay, this is where it gets a little bit complicated. Well, actually, let's just continue these belts first, I guess. So I'll actually delete that belt real quick. Mark three, this thing just feeds straight in. All right, so we're not going to the one on the end. Leave that one alone. Uh, okay, so just in case, we'll get these all Mark III belts leading in. Okay, so we're all done with that. Now, this is where it gets a little complicated. Let's put on a belt here, a lift, conveyor lift, Mark III, if we can. And aim it out that way, to the left. We'll just leave that as is for a moment. Let's now do these guys' outputs. So we need mergers. Mergers facing forward. And they'll have to be a little closer to the machines to avoid the arm of that machine, basically. So this one is facing out to the left. And this one is, these are all going to be coming towards me. And all of them as well, not just the first three. I'm using Mark III belts, but I don't think it... Actually, yeah, it probably does matter. These are going to be making biomass. So those constructors are all making biomass. So why do we need so many different ones? Is because to make biomass, there is a different recipe for each thing. You can't have biomass wood and then feed it mycelia. You need to select the specific recipe, and that's why we're using programmable splitters to decide where each thing can go, even though we're going to load it all onto the one belt. If in the future they ever update the game where biomass is just whatever you give the recipe, 
you know, then that'd be great, but it would make this factory redundant, actually, but, you know, that's why that's why we're doing it this way, basically. So, um, next thing, then, would be a splitter. Alright, so we'll pop a splitter right there. Split in there, and split here. These are going to be doing solid biofuel. Now, the biofuel is also going to be set to 75%. Meaning each one is making 45 per minute. Now, you might be wondering about that thing, right? So let's now grab another lift here. And we'll place it right here onto the same merger. And reverse its direction so it's an input. Keep it same height. And now we can grab a Mark III belt and just connect the two. And we get a nice right angle. Sorry, as we lead over and feed that in. So, um... That's because what we're going to do is if I happen to throw in some biomass that I want to turn into biofuel, the biomass will travel along here as well with all the other vegetation, but it'll get separated out and bypass these first few machines which are all doing biomass. So this will be the, this is already biomass line going into here, merging with the rest of the biomass and then going into the solid biofuel <laughs> constructors. It sounds messy, but it, it really isn't. Okay, um, all well and good. Next up, we're going to do the line of alien material. So we're going to be making alien protein. So we'll grab a Mark III belt, and then out of this programmable splitter, we're going to follow the same sort of methodology. Go back to here. Roll forward. If we want to be consistent, we could even put them on the same line. So I think that's where it stops. And then we need our programmable splitters again. All right, so the last four splitters. You can cut down on these a little bit if you don't choose to have one on the end. Because in theory, you don't need one on the end. But I like to just, I don't know, keep consistency. Uh, yep. All right. So there we go. All right. So you're just going to feed each of these. Oh, it's very intense music. It's going to feed each of these with the belts. And feed all of these as well. Okay, and then for the outputs, we just need mergers. Now, I'm going to bring the mergers in, again, quite close and out to the left. And then this will be our final one there. And that's where we're aiming, right? We're going to bring this belt here into that final machine. Because all the alien protein is going to convert into biomass. So that's going to have its own line, basically. Um, now I'm just trying to think, should the pipeline stay still with a loop thing going over it? Yeah, probably. So we can do what we did down there, but here. That makes sense to me. There we go, fixed. And we're not creeping over anything we shouldn't be. We're right on the edge. Nice. Except for that arm of the machine. <laughs> Might be hanging a little low there, but whatever. Uh, okay, good. Let me just uh, make the music a bit more chill. Okay, so... Next up, let's decide what, e what each machine is doing. So we'll say that this one is Mycelia. All right, so machine number one on this line, Mycelia. Next one over is going to be leaves. Biomass leaves. Next one over is going to be biomass wood. And the final one is going to be biomass alien protein. Uh, similarly, over on this side of things, we're going to start with the alien protein hog then we're gonna go hatcher we're just gonna go in a line basically then stinger and then spitter all right so they're all putting out protein all right so making our way back down to the very first programmable splitter this is the one that's gonna have the most stuff on it so let's configure it by pressing E so a programmable splitter basically works by it's a filter system so you can choose what goes into any output so we've got an output that says any here but we don't want that let's just get rid of that for now so the left output is going to be any undefined so this is a sort of a catch-all box where if we throw something part of our inventory in there that can't be handled by these machines you don't want everything getting backed up and clogged and then you have to find which one ended up taking the wrong thing right you don't want anything to stop so as a result this is a little catch-all any undefined anything that we haven't defined here in the center output 
will go left and into a box. So I can just run downstairs and quickly collect any mistakes that I made. Uh, the center output is effectively going to be everything we can possibly dump in here. All right, so that's it. So flower petals, mycelia, leaves, wood, biomass, hog remains, hatcher remains, stinger remains, and plasma spitter remains. So anything that's undefined in that list, anything that isn't in that list goes left into a storage container as a catch-all, like, error-catching type thing. So what we can do is press Control-C and then Control-V and just paste it onto this one. So this way it just always keeps you reminded about which ones you have to deal with. So basically, out the center, we're going to send flower petals and none of the other stuff. But I have it written down next to me so I can just write it all out again. So left output this time, mycelia, leaves, wood, biomass, center, flower petals, and right, hog remains, hatcher remains, stinger remains, and plasma spitter remains. So all of the animal carcasses or whatever goes that way, and all of the vegetation and stuff goes that way. Flowers just go straight ahead and they'll be turned into color cartridges for us to use as patterns. So our first port of call here for the vegetation will be mycelia going out the left, leaves and wood in the center, and then biomass out the right as it goes over. So we'll just paste that onto this one now. So mycelia shouldn't exist anymore. So now on this side we have just leaves. And then we can get rid of it from here. We also do not have biomass any further. So that's fine. Just copy that setting and I will paste it here again. Uh, center output, there's nothing left anymore. <laughs> and we'll just say wood. This is why I was saying this one technically isn't needed. All that should ever really be here is the one thing we do. But I just like the consistency of having the same splitters the whole way down. But you don't need that one, and you technically don't need that one either. So you could save if you're hurting for supercomputers. Okay, so let's go again. All right, so for our first one, we want it to be hog remains. So we'll get rid of it from this list. And out the right goes the hog remains. Yep paste this one then so we've already dealt with hog remains next will be hatcher remains we'll get rid of that paste again next will be so we get rid of those two stinger remains get rid of that and then finally the just the plasma spitter remains goes out the right All right, so I'll just double check those machines. Plasma spitter, stinger, hatcher, and hog. Great. All right, good. So that's uh, all the programmable splitters done. So that's our filter system, basically. All right, so we selected the liquid biofuel recipe for our refinery. Now, the last thing to do is just add in a little storage container here, just a standard one. And we have just about enough room to tuck it in between these machines evenly. So I wanted to nudge it over there. That's good and bring it forward, I guess, to about there. Anyways, uh, this container is gonna store up some solid biofuel. If I ever decide to turn this off, and then we let this fill up, we can use the solid biofuel for the chainsaw. I don't know, actually, if you can use packaged fuel in your chainsaw. I think it has to be solid biofuel. I don't know if they've changed or updated that yet. Because um, I know mods have done it. Because it seems very restrictive to be like, a chainsaw uses just this, so. I could be wrong. I haven't actually double-checked that. Um, this needs to be a merger, by the way. But that's just one reason for this container here. It's like, oh, if I ever get low on solid biofuel, these guys make solid biofuel. Everything's the same. It's just that means I have to run down here and just grab stuff out of here instead of uh, the biofuel making its way back to me. I did think about, like, hooking up a switch to make it kind of work for me, but I decided against it in the end. All right, so a support on the very edge of the foundation there, and then a pipe that goes up and curves. So I just did that by placing this foundation underneath it and then removing the supports once I built it. Looks a little weird, but I don't know. Give me your ideas on how to make that look better. It's really strange the way it comes down and up and down again, but yeah, it's just the way it is. All right, um, so that's our pipeline. So we'd have to send the pipeline over to the packager as the final thing to do. And I was going to use a large fluid buffer here because we just unlocked it. It requires three heavy modular frames, and she's thick. Um, she's a thick girl. So <laughs> let's maybe move her right in the center there. Yeah, so instead, I'm going with three buffers instead. I mean, we don't really need them. It's mostly for aesthetics, really. But just in case fuel wants to get backed up, it can be kind of nice looking at it and how much it's getting stored and everything. So let's just grab our pipeline. I was going to use the big thick one, but it's uh, it's just too big. It'll block like a lot of the view of the place, especially when it's all lit up nicely. All right, so we'll just send these into each other. 
All right, so with our three buffers, I reckon now we'll bring this pretty close over, maybe just even one back, and then we'll use the stackable here. All right, send that up to there and across. Yeah, that looks a bit better, I think, because it just has a more natural bend in the pipe, more deliberate bend in the pipe like that was done on purpose. <laughs> Yeah, so this is the entrance that we have already. So this is, this could be really difficult and this could take like an hour to show properly. So I recommend grabbing the save file on this one or I'll see what I can do in terms of production documents to make a floor plan that makes sense. Um, but we're gonna be using these kind of corner pieces in order to create a diagonal line. And then we have to create ramps and stuff that bring us up because we're gonna be build, bringing in uh, a bunch of ore from outside. So I'm going to start from the outside and work my, work my way down to that area. Alright, so I'm just sitting at the base of the waterfall here and I wanted to kind of line up the first initial foundations, like spending a bit of time on that just so everyone is on the same page. So we're going to grab a regular 2 meter foundation, hold it control, snap it onto the world grid. Uh, that line that you're seeing coming out of it is trying to line up with the miners. Don't worry about that though. So, snapping onto world, world grid. I'm looking at the left side here. Now, there are some branches that I'm going to be using as a reference point. If you've collected them, that's on you. You're going to have to figure out another way or load my save or do something to orientate yourself properly. Because you can pick them up and remove them. Don't do that. Uh, not only do they look nice, it's also something that we're going to be using as a reference. So, too low, too low, just right. Okay, so we're just right when we're at the kind of fork in the branches, right? There is a fork on those branches right there, right where it splits. This foundation will line up just at the split. Yeah. Perfect. I'll show you an example of it not being perfect if we were down here or even just one lower. That's not perfect because we can see the split. We don't want to be able to see the split, right? We can still see it. It's right there. You shouldn't be able to see any rock between the two branches inside the split. With the wood just curling around the left of it like that. So that's the way to go. All right. With that in place, that's the height that we're going to be starting with. So that's all well and good. But we've got little fancy design for you here. I was looking at that waterfall and I was thinking we could do something with this. So let's bring a half foundation across the entire way now. We'll remove our initial one and bring the half, continue the half foundation across. Same principle by the way, it's still in the same place, you know, still in the same place. Alright, now we're going to use a blueprint that I designed called the Foundation Drain, 2 meters. And it's basically a series of metal walls I'm just trying to think which way should we line it up. The arrow facing in, I think, is good. And we'll go with default placement mode. I'm going to start it here, actually. This is a little tricky to see where we are there. So we're lined up like so. Yep. Anyway, it's just a series of metal walls. Um, but the way they're aligned should create the effect that it looks like a drain. Anyway, we'll click that one down. Sorry, that hog was just getting out. It's just distracting me a little bit. So as long as the arrow is facing forward, these should all line up next to each other just fine without overlapping each other. Bring that one down here as well. Right, then we'll grab the half foundation again and start on the inside. Now, holding control doesn't quite work with this, so we'll have to rotate it manually. Hold control now, lock it in, but then move it forward. Yeah. Now, I think that's right, just to make sure it is. If I just grab a normal two meter foundation holding control here, Bring it across. Yeah, world grid is intact. That's the important thing. All right, there you go. So now what I can do is I'll probably do something like a uh, little bit of concrete on the outside. Just again, two meters for now. Just go across, just so we have some room to back up a bit. Don't want to ruin the entire river. But that's the effect that we have just even here, right? We have this kind of... It's kind of like... What are those things the farmers have for it to stop cattle walking over? Is it just called a cattle drain or something or a cattle walkway? can't remember what they're called, but they look just like that. They're metal bars that sit across a road, usually, or some sort of path to prevent... And cows don't like stepping on it, so it's to prevent them going across. But for us, it's like a, a rain catcher. It just lets the, the water continue on through. All right, that's all well and good. Um, what's next will be the automated gate. So we'll put one on the left and one on the right. Looking good. And then we'll just grab this wall, make it a four meter... Line that one up there. Line that one up there. And then we'll place these on top of each other if we can get them to line up. 
almost like a little vault or bomb shelter or something, right? How cool is that? So it's tucked in behind the waterfall. We have our little rain catcher drain thing. I'll turn on, we'll turn on global illumination later, and then we can kind of come on in into our area. All right, so that's the height that we've set. Um, so I've got some crude foundation blueprints for me to follow to kind of get this done. So using four meters the whole way down, I'll just do one line even here, but I'm going to put this on line because it'll be like almost impossible to follow. So, um, no, I made a mistake already. Yeah, so anyway, three in, two down, and then it's five straight out. So one, two, three, four, five. So that goes all the way out to there. Yep, that's perfect. All right, so again, on this side, then we can go three out, two down, and then it really only has room for one, but you know, extend it to fill in any gaps that you want. So that's all well and good. I'll probably make this coated concrete. It'll look quite nice in here, I think, with global illumination. All right, next line over. So this will be the logistics line coming in. So there is a bit of rocks creeping over. That's, that's fine, that's okay. Uh, so yeah, so we'll start here at one, two, three. It comes down two as well. And then it goes one, but then we use the down corner ramp. So we haven't used that before. So I'll put one there. And then we're gonna put another one down, but rotate it. So what this gives us is two foundations with their kind of like they're, but they're cut in half uh, diagonally. So what we can do is go to the customizer, go to material. This is gonna be asphalt on this side. And this will probably be coated concrete. So as we're walking down, we'll have it split here for us to continue walking across. At least that's the idea. So we go with another one foundation here, I think. And then it's a ramp of three. So we do three down. Now something nice we can still do here is continue this concrete across to create a like really built up effect. I think that could be kind of nice. We'll have a little fence going along that as well. Right, there we go. So if you found that hard to follow, you're not alone. I mean, I had it written down and I found it hard to follow, but that's pretty much it. So just we have all these like little diagonal changes that then lead down so that we split our entrance between the walkable sort of area and the logistics area. A very quick, I guess we'll cover the railing in the cosmetic section. What we should do next is literally just pull in the belts so we have that at least ready to go. All right, so what we need to do next is actually remove these two walls. We're gonna open up our conveyor connections category and go with the conveyor wall two. And I wonder, does conveyor wall three? No, two is good placement, so we'll go there and there. So now we've got wall holes for our conveyors to actually come in. And then we're gonna use the conveyor pole belts. So we'll just line this up with here, right on the edge of where the ramp begins. All right, there we go. It's a little bit chaotic, but I tried to just keep that consistent rule of just being, you know, one little space in from the edge. And certain places it looks quite nice, like there. Pretty happy with that, but, you know, then there's, like, a lot of bending on the way up. And, uh, I don't know if I'm happy with that, but I decided to push that one in rather than curling around it. it I'm of two minds, basically, about it. So maybe due for a little bit of extra cleanup. But um, yeah, that should be the entrance basically done then. Like, I, I don't really think I've got more planned to it than that, other than just now hooking up these belts here. So I'm going to do that in a bit of a lazy way because I haven't really finalized any proper nice way of doing that. So these are our entrance things here. All right, so we'll go from here to there, and then that just goes straight in. All right, and so that's in as well. So basically... I actually can't remember which one's which. I think copper goes along the top. So the iron will go along the bottom. Like so. So I might clean up these belts on a stream or something. I like doing some of the more cosmetic stuff on streams. Dealing with the outside part of this uh, build will be a nice thing to try and clean up and like design a little mini factory or enclosure for the two um, miners. But from here forward is done, if that makes sense. So we kind of come in, belts are separated, they kind of get a bit closer together, and then we make our way down. So still have to do, obviously, the cosmetic section, but that is now the entrance done. That was at least the plan for the entrance. Right. Next thing is powering on these machines and getting things up and running. Oh, actually, sorry. <laughs> getting ahead of myself. We got to bring these over to the smelter. Uh, so yeah, let's get started on that.
Yeah, so I have the middle of this kind of walkway reserved for doing this. So one, two. So we just to follow that around real quickly on the ground at least. Go like this. Got to go all the way down so we can take a, a right turn right there. Yeah, so uh, if this is iron and that is iron, then the bottom line, which is iron, will do the splitting. All right, and then we don't really need this here, I suppose. What we could do is just have a conveyor pole maybe right here. And we bring that down and in. And it's as easy as that. All right, so that's our copper fed. So there's logistics are now fully done. The entrance is done. The to-do list is intact. <laughs> All right, good. Yeah, loving it. Nice. All right, next up is power. So we're going to power on this place and get it up and running. So I think what I'm going to do for now, just to get the older machines up and running, is just put the power poles right next to the machines and connect them, obviously, back together and send that back outside. But in the cosmetic pass... Oh, they're already hooked up. In the cosmetic pass, we'll probably hang beams down with power lines coming into the machines. And that'll look a little bit nicer. It just kind of depends where the lighting goes before we do that. So just going to make it pretty simple. Just keep the power lines following the belts and send them out the back. All right, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Power has been delivered. Our miners are now on 45 iron per minute and 30 copper per minute, making its way through our little entranceway. It's been running for about a minute, but it is 60 per minute belt, so can be a little bit slow to get to the destination. Um, but I've got in an inventory just chock full of leaves and all of these alien remains from... Pretty much any time I remember to pick it up and store it in a little container at the hub. Also got some products that I don't have anything to refine with, so hopefully they'll go into our little error catching area. And this is as far as the iron has made it so far, so we still have to hook up the machines together. All the machines should be now active. Ooh, looks like I didn't hook that one up. I'm seeing yellow lights across the board, it's what we like to see. The packager has no power. Did I not hook that up as well? I guess not. Dragged out the pole for it, never hooked it up. Right, so, ooh, here's another little issue. Didn't give them their floor hole. All right, let's dump all of our stuff in. I'm gonna go grass first. Um, maybe then some flowers, some of the animal remains, biofuel, some of the wood. Mycelia, biomass, alien protein. Just drop it all in there. And then I'll shuffle it around a bit. Just to kind of change it up. So that it's not just one stream of stuff constantly. Alright, we'll try that for a little bit. And maybe throw in some of this earlier. Okay, so it's nice and disorderly. Uh, let's just go downstairs then and see how it's looking. So we can see it getting sorted already. Love to see it. Leaves are flowing out one side. Now that's the way it's going to be, right? Because it handles things one at a time, one stack at a time. So the leaves stack is getting sorted. Did anything go in here already? Yep. Some of the alien protein and the biofuel. Because it's not going to be handled by our factory. So our error checking is working. And then we flew along here. And our machines are just going to get straight to work processing that into biomass. The water extractor is on, feeding 45 water over to our refinery. So the first bits of biomass are already rolling out. Biofuel is literally blocked up because we <laughs> didn't connect it. And there we go, biofuel flowing in. And I think that needed a Mark II belt, was it? 90 per minute, but Mark III, let's, that's fine. How much is coming out of here? 45, right? Yeah, yeah. Do I have any of the... No, not with me. Over in the corner when I dump my inventory reinforced iron plates. But that's going to be the first batches of liquid biofuel rolling along now. And we're hoping that at the same time our smelters are working on creating the canisters, right? The iron plates are going to come out first. The iron was a little ahead of the copper. Going to flow into here. So we're just going to be waiting on that copper to come down. First batches of copper sheets rolling out. And that should allow this machine to fill nicely with a little bit of liquid first. It's going to take a while for it to get there, though, I think. It does not get stored in the buffers, by the way. The buffers act just like pipes until something on their output gets blocked, and then they backfill. So it's nice to see this at the refinery. It is at 91%. Must have had a little bit of a sputter early on, but 
seems to have more than enough biofuel flowing into it now and it's just creeping its percentage up. It's cranking out 60 per minute liquid biofuel. Pipes are getting flushed uh, full with biofuel. And hey, there we go. Our packager is actually started. So it's probably intermittently making batches while it receives its liquid. It'll take a while for the pipes to like, kind of fully get filled. Um, but there you go, 71% actually. All right, so it must have made a few batches already. I kind of missed it. And, oh, nice. We have our flowers are getting turned into colored cartridges, and they're making their way upstairs. So let's see how much we've made already. It's only been running for a couple minutes. So here we now have 18 packaged liquid biofuel, or 20 now in total. Awesome. And here, got nearly 100 colored cartridges. And we still have quite a ways to go. And this, these are the heavy hitters. Any of the remains is what's going to give us quite a lot. And I also want to check our redundancy area and see how much has gone into there. Yeah, so some of the solid biofuel and some of the alien protein doesn't go anywhere because it doesn't get refined by this place. It's already being refined. Now, you could make... You could further develop this place to say, like, okay... Perhaps if alien protein were to roll along here, it would do what the biomass is doing, right? Just like this area. And we could say that up and over and out this way, we could join it back on. In fact, should we do that? Why the hell not? It would actually create some symmetry, which would be nice. So I'll do this. We'll aim it this way. These power poles are going to move anyway. We'll just do this on the fly. And then we want it to merge back into here. See, I was planning on having a walkway come down here, so that's why I didn't really want to block this area too much. But I think we can work around it. Uh, so let's try this, but maybe here. And please just tell me these are magically lined up. They are indeed. Right, so now we get to decide a left output that's going to be alien protein. Alright, we'll leave that as is. So alien protein goes out the left, goes down and around, and merges with the rest of it. So now we can change our little error correction. Alright, so we'll select this one first. So on the right, we want alien protein. And here, straight ahead, we want to say alien protein. I don't know how many things you can add here. Maybe it's infinite, I don't know. Alien protein. Alright, now I'll pick back up that protein. And we'll throw it in first, just to see what happens. I'm sure it'll work. It's just nice to see it at work. So we'll do this, right? So it's at the first in the queue now. And it'll take a while for the other grass to get cleared, but we can actually see it making its way out slowly. That's what I like to see, man. Full stacks. Full stacks. Color cartridges and liquid biofuel packaged on the risers. I think that's pretty much it, right? That is the place powered. Now what we're going to do is go unlock that jetpack and uh, maybe play around with it. we got to see this alien protein traveling along first. There we go. Out to the right it goes, and we'll follow that along. And then we're going to beautify this place. You're not even going to recognize it by the time I'm done with it. All right, so we're expecting to see this go up and over. There we go. It's as easy as that. It's as easy as that. And it'll continue around to go into this machine again which already has 37 inside of it. That's nice, I like do, doing error correction. It was always kind of a fun thing when I used to do programming. You try to think of all the ways that you can mess this place up and then you can sometimes find solutions for things like, I initially thought, no, we wouldn't want to deal with that. It's the same could be said for even the biofuel. Maybe there's a way to handle that, you know, if we get it all the way over to where it needs to go. Right, so I've just arrived outside of the coal power plant. People may remember that I sent up a makeshift kind of plastic, rubber, and then petroleum coke refinery. The petroleum coke was purely just to handle some of the heavy oil residue and just sink it. Uh, people also mentioned at the time that you could bring it into the coal facility and set up another generator or something. I, I, it's not really worth it, but you could do that, of course. Um, but yeah, so I just switched this plastic one to fuel and then just built a packager really quickly. I gave it all of the canisters that I took with me and we just need to make 50 packaged fuel. Once we have 50, we can advance to the next milestone. So I'm basically just waiting on this to kind of fill up. It's going to require a little bit more of the oil than is going in. So I'm just going to cut this as well. So all the oil is just going to come this way now. 
And then I'll just reconnect this place just as it was and leave it standing. It was good just to leave a little bit of plastic and rubber in two containers. I think they make 20 per minute each. Uh, so it was uh, quite a nice thing that I've revisited often just to advance some milestones early on in the game here. All right, I have arrived. Let's go. Jetpack. So more inventory slots. Hell yeah. And then the jetpack itself, which of course we'll have to craft, I guess. Hopefully I have what I need for it. All right, so there's the plastic, there's the rubber, and the packaged fuel. Let's go. All right, milestone unlocked jetpack. R&D inflated your pocket dimension has provided a jetpack, which operates on, on oil-based fuel for increased navigational capabilities as well as odds of survival. All right, sweet, we got one. So this is actually gonna replace our back slot of a parachute. Which in some ways is cool, in other ways it's kind of annoying because it's like, ah, uh, kind of wish I could use both, but fair enough. Uh, now there's a new little thing here, a little cog wheel that you can click and say preferred fuel. Our preferred fuel is going to be packaged liquid biofuel. So just click that and that should be set now to preferred fuel. Good. Alright, let's give it a whirl. We are jetpacking and I'm just two floating legs. Look at the height we've got, still only halfway now. This is going to give you a lot of presses, and if you just tap it, you can go really high as well. But I guess who needs a parachute when you can just cushion your fall with this, right? Oof. Oh my god, that didn't feel like I cushioned it, but I guess I did. Um, <laughs> yeah, pretty good, right? And we might use some turbo fuel every now and then. Turbo fuel for the boost, this for the long-lasting, high-rising kind of flight. Um, but now we should be able to do things and build generally in big spaces like that a lot easier. So that's the jetpack done. So next up, the final thing for our video today is gonna to be just quickly going over some of the cosmetics that I've planned for that area. All right, a nice shiny floor. Uh, downstairs, we're gonna start using a blueprint, right? So everywhere that has this foundation like along the edges of the water, uh, we're gonna use a new blueprint of mine. So I'll just show you what it looks like real quickly here. Go into my cosmetic section and Foundation, railing, and lighting. So I'll just sink this down, rotate it around like so. Lock that one in first. So basically, obviously without lumen on and global illumination, we can't quite see the lighting effect that it's supposed to give, but generally that's the idea there. Yeah, I was thinking that I might actually even change it to purple. I guess we'll see when lumen is on, but it doesn't really matter if I have to go around changing each one, you can do it quite quickly. But yeah, so I'm just basically gonna get rid of like these foundations here copy this as a blueprint oh sorry switch to blueprint mode and then if we look back at it we should be able to do it okay yeah there we go so that's going to give us some nice strip lighting running alongside the the outer perimeters of our foundations basically all the way around all right time to do the centerpiece so in order to do this we're basically going to go with uh windows and steel walls so, I'll start with a basic steel wall here, just up from one meter up from the edge. And then place a window on top of it, just like that. And I'm gonna get rid of this, and then we're just gonna go with a regular wall, steel wall, sorry, down below it. That was just to raise the wall, basically. So now we can use this as like a wrapper that goes around the whole thing. This can go to here, and across, and to here. So up by three. So one, two, three, but it's, if you remember on the inside then it's raised by one so it just looks like it's a little bit raised on this side so we have to do that for every side so the best way i can think of doing it is just getting that one meter wall on each side placing the windows on top of it first all right so we go across one two three one two three and then we just replace it put the proper steel wall down because it has that black tip to it Of course, I have to find my way out of here. But I'll just cut a hole in it after it's done. Did I do that right? Yeah. Good. All right, so I'll just hop out through here. Yeah. Put the window back on. No one will ever know. Now, the other thing then as well, putting the ceiling on it. So, I'll just get the steel wall to go on top now.
Now, there's a little bit of a gap, so I'll just double up the steel wall where it needs to close that gap up on top. I think that's fine. Alright, now we've got a sort of a, a glass containment with one slug inside of it, but I'm going to go in there and put more things in there. <laughs> other slugs I find are just other things. Maybe if I find a doggo, it'd be kind of cute to keep him in there. Oh, actually, something I forgot about in here is I want to put down lighting uh, on the inside. So again, we're going to use the signs, right? The organization, label sign, four meters. Um, and yeah, not on the top bit, but down one. If anything, maybe even down two. Nah, just down one, yeah. I think down one's good. Uh, and then just bring that across on each side. And I'm going to color it that copper teal color I have given out before. And again, all the colors I use are in... On my link, whatdarnplace.com slash satisfactory. If you go to blueprints, it says color schemes. And it has all the hex values that I use, so you can use them as well if you want. So for color scheme, the way I'm doing it is I basically have this color here. So it's a combination of my dark gray color with my new purple color. So the purple color is the trim. Um, and be, this is the kind of way we're doing it. So the gray is the primary and the trim secondary color is the purple. But... For the actual splitters and things, I'll invert that. So just for the machines, first off, we go around it like this. And then for any of the logistics, like the belts and... Uh, yeah, really just the belts and what else am I trying to think of? Mergers and splitters. They'll have the inverse of that color scheme. So once everything's painted, which I think it is, even that's now done. Uh, now we can flip it and go around the other bits. Now, uh, just a quick change. I decided to get rid of two of the fluid buffers and just leave the one that was in the middle. I made sure to use every drop I could before I got rid of them though. I didn't want to waste any of the biofuel because while it, it technically is renewable, right? You can keep killing animals that keep spawning and that way you can keep making it. So that's good. But I suppose a lot of it's not renewable. So I just, I don't know. I feel It feels very wasteful deleting it. Anyways, um, so yeah, just left the one buffer there because I've put in a series of catwalks now that can carry us around the place. And this one just seemed to be at a good distance where we can just reach over and check it. Um, these catwalks then lead over to our little area over that way. Leading up the stairs here to our smelters. So the place is getting a lot more neat. I'm going with grip metal on the edges and asphalt through the center, generally where there are belts. Uh, and I'm just still kind of adding some color and stuff to the area. A nice little tip for metal beams is if you press R, you can actually go into freeform mode. And if you can pretty much pick anywhere you want to latch onto then, you're not really constrained by the traditional grid. And as well as that, before you click to confirm it, you can rotate. So I'm going to angle this down towards me a little bit. I'm just creating a bit of an arch area there. Now I might play around with it, but generally the idea would be this, that we can angle these signs now to kind of face down onto the walkway. And that could look quite cool. So it'll take a little bit of playing around with it, but the idea is definitely there. In fact, that might be good enough. We'll see. I've got some... I've got also a blueprint of LED lights with warm lighting, I've called it. Um, these can be a bit more tricky to place, though, because of the way they snap onto things. There we go. That's what you want to do with them. Um, so once they're lined up like that, you can just bring them onto the seam of a foundation. Then you know that it's, like, lined up correctly. So can we do that? It's as far as I can go over, actually. Yeah, about there is good. And then we get these little warm lights just to just to guide us, guide us across. All right. So one of the last things for me to do here is build a diagonal line of railing along here. Now, obviously, normally you can't really do that, right? It doesn't snap. It wants to snap to the grid foundation. So what we can use is a road barrier. Now, in order to get this to look right, I think we have to spill over the edge here just a little bit, I think. And then if we hold control, we can put down modern railing as a replacement, and this should, I think, line up. Let's see. Ooh, we're actually a tiny bit short. Maybe I didn't have to come forward. The longer the diagonal line, the more usually it, it kind of works itself out. Actually, no, that's as good as I can get it, um, I think. It's as good as I know how to get it anyway. If you got tips for that, let me know, but it can obviously be extremely finicky. I'm just gonna paint that a little bit now. Uh, so that's the idea. I'm just going to do that like pretty much all the way up. So there will be a little bit of like sometimes that little bit of overlap. Um, but I'll try to minimize that where I can. Fresh kill. Feels good. Alright. 
Global Illumination is on. Let's pay a little visit to our secret underground behind the waterfall factory, shall we? So some lighting might have to be added in here in the future. Although surprisingly, even with Global Illumination, you wouldn't think there's any light sources here, but for some reason this cave is fairly bright at the beginning, and then it gets darker the deeper we go. Alright, we're entering the bioluminescent cave. Our railing is working out pretty good, just some tiny little gaps if you're really paying attention, but for the most part, pretty clean. Alright, what do you think? I'm grinning from ear to ear, I think it looks great. It's just Global Illumination doing all the heavy lifting, and these big signs of course. Now, let's just say we just picked up some animal remains, and I went to another factory and grabbed some stuff as well. We'll throw in some of the flowers, hog, whatever, all that stuff can go in there and figure itself out. I'll move the flowers to the beginning, actually. Love the bioluminescent cave. How cool is this, huh? This is satisfactory. <laughs> see some of our biomass already bypassing those machines and going up and over to get made into solid biofuel straight away. Still need to put a few extras into the glass containment as well. It'd be great if I could capture an animal and pop them in there. Alright, let's take a f go for a little walk. I want to be quick because I imagine the video is running long and we've already gone over the entire logistics and everything. It's more just the cosmetics now. Ah, that's a bit of a mistake. I haven't cleaned up the power poles inside yet. I've run out of time just a little bit. So a lot of these power poles are just going to be fed from the ceiling, similar to how they are in the entrance on the way in. We have our purple neon strips running along the railing. But the overhead lights, they do a pretty good job at giving some ambient lighting to the area. I would just be quiet and let us soak in the atmosphere of the machines doing their thing. So what's coming in at the moment? Wood. Lots of wood making its way over that way. So pretty cool. That's basically it. I'm really happy with how it's turned out on the cosmetic side. It's such a night and day difference when you turn on global illumination and also just like put a little bit of time and effort into painting the machines and putting some lights around. It just looks really, really beautiful. Very happy with it. The blue lights contrasting with the kind of purple, I think worked really well just because the, that's what the cave's natural lighting is. And then just to kind of separate it, having the green inside the containment, a kind of teal green I think looks really good. Even the lighting is bouncing off of the water that's falling, which is so nice. We have that small little LED lights that I've called them. Warm lighting. Again, blueprinted. All the blueprints are available. I think that's going to have to be it. So we've now got a container full. 4,800. And the next one is 1,900. So this place works a treat. And how many color cartridges do we have? 760 as of right now. Now, I threw in a few other things there. Was there anything falling down the spill-off? Yeah, the, bio, the solid biofuel is nowhere to go, so it just comes back, which is totally fine. Working as intended. Beep, bop, beep, boop, beep, boop, beep. Yeah, so some extra lighting and maybe, um, see, I didn't use double foundations here, so you can see that the floor, the ceiling, you know, above me here, the floor above me, we can see what it's made of. And that's why I always like using double foundations. It'd be nice just to have a metal kind of look to it on the bottom. It's kind of nice the way it reflects the lights, though, actually, thinking about it, the coated concrete from the underside. All right, guys, that's going to have to be it. I'm really looking forward to seeing what people think of this place. Remember, the save file will be out alongside the video, and so will the blueprints. If you want to build it yourself, the floor plan documents, all of it's there. Appreciate any support you can give, viewing the video, sharing it with friends, liking it, telling people to go get their biofuel on Reddit or whatever it might be, and here's a great way to do it, huh? That's going to have to be it for me. Thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you in the next one.